The number of crossings across the southern border in 2020, the, his last year of being president, was around 400,000. Now it's 3 million. I just see a lot of well-meaning people who don't seem to understand that actions have consequences, whereas a lot of people are now starting to, to suspect that this is deliberate. There are Democrats all over the place, on camera and in print, saying, I need more people in my district to save my myself from losing my re-election. Isn't this going to create a massive backlash? 100%, and it's already starting. Megan, you're one of my favorite and most astute commentators in America. And one of the things I love, and Francis and I, we come to America a lot, is the can-do problem-solving spirit in America. Like when I come to the US, I feel like it's a place where people just solve problems. Uh, they work stuff out. When things go wrong, they just get together and, and solve them. And yet, as I'm watching from the outside and when I come to visit increasingly, I mean, you guys don't have a southern border. Illegal immigrants are beating <laughs> up your cops and then walking out of jail the next day, giving journalists the finger. What the hell is going on? So sometimes it's a little slow moving, that instinct that you're talking about, but eventually it kicks in and it could take an election cycle. It could take a four year presidential election cycle, but eventually we will correct. Typically how it goes is we err, we overcorrect, and then we correct the overcorrection and land it where it ought to land. And I think we're going through that in a couple of different things right now, but certainly the rise in crime is one of them. The border, I mean, that's just been such a hot mess and it's going to get solved. I do think I may be in the minority, but I really do think that Trump is probably going to run away with it uh, in 24. And that'll be largely driven to this immigration mess. Joe Biden can't fool the people with a last minute deal that has a ton of holes in it, that he's really pro border enforcement. We know the truth. Um, you know, same thing on the race essentialism, on the gender madness, slowly but surely we're moving back to normal. So that's that's a plus, but you know, it's, it's not lightning speed. It's interesting you say that because to a lot of people, cynics perhaps, but most people would don't think, I don't think Shea your optimist, most people would say you've got an election between two geriatric people who've both been president for one term, neither of whom fixed any of these issues. Let's be honest, Donald Trump talked about them, but didn't really get on top of it. Why are you so optimistic? Well, I didn't, he didn't fix them. And look, Trump had a Republican Congress when he first took over, so that not doing more of those first two years can definitely be held against him. However, the, the number of crossings across the southern border in 2020, the, his last year of being president, was around 400,000. Now it's 3 million. It's, there's no comparison. You know, it's, it's not an island. So there's going to be some illegal crossings. Getting it down to zero is probably uh, a dream that we're ne we'll never attain with or without a wall. But he did do something. He did a lot. He didn't do as much as the Ann Coulters of the world want. I get it, nor that I would want to see. But we were f much better off under the Trump policies, thanks to this guy, Stephen Miller, than we were once Biden took over. And it's been reported in the New York Times, made a decision to be, quote, more humane. He wanted the world to see us as more humane. And what did we get? We got rape trees at the southern border where underage girls are literally tied up and raped repeatedly by gang members, cartel members who are getting people across the border. We got murders along the southern border. We, got, we have Americans being beaten and robbed and murdered by illegals. We have people from the terrorist watch list entering the country. And none of this is humane in any way. So it's just a typical liberal policy where in words, it may sound good. You like the appearance of being virtuous, but in practice, a lot of people are getting hurt and treated incredibly unfairly. I mean, we could go down the list of ways in which they've done this to us. So, you know, that's my rant on that. I remember, Megan, when we were talking to Adam Carolla and he summed it up very, very nicely where he said, if you want to do something illegally, you've basically got carte blanche. But if you want to do something legally, then the government are going to make it as difficult as possible for you. That is insanity, surely. That's certainly true when it comes to the border. Um, I'll just give you one example. We met some friends in Paris, uh, in Provence, a couple of, well, last summer. And they wanted to come over to visit with their children and just, and they're really hoping to get a job here. What they'd really like is to move to the United States and work here. And the guy is a chef. He, he cooks for a living. They live very modestly in France. And, you know, I said, you know what? I'm sure you could probably get a job cooking over here. They need people. You know, we're looking for people. They, 
Do you have any idea the amount of red tape they need to go through in order for him to actually work legally here in the United States, jumping through the proper hoops? It's ridiculous. But of course, if he would just fly to Mexico and sneak across the southern border, they would give him a hotel, they would give him a work card, they would give him a food card. Pretty soon, in some places, they'd be giving him a voting card. It, they would roll out the red carpet for him. I mean, I saw that. That was a joke, actually, that Biden tore down the border wall and instead rolled out the red carpet for the illegals. That So Adam's got a point, right? If you try to jump through the hoops properly, it would probably take you years, years to get a work permit here in the United States. But right now we've got Democrat governors in at least two or three states pushing to expedite the process for the illegals who broke all the rules. And Megan, why are they doing this? Well, I firmly believe it's because they want to change the voter rules. I, I don't care if they call that the great replacement theory or what they want to call it. They've been saying it for years and I take them at their word. I don't think it's about a racial thing. I think they want new Democrats and they, they bring immigrants over. They're banking on the immigrants being beholden to the government and stuck on government assistance. And there's only one party that would like to keep you there forever, and that's Democrats. And that you'll just like a good little, you know, public assistance person vote blue for the rest of your existence. And that's how they're going to change uh, states like Texas, states like Arizona, states like Georgia, in particular, those border states from red to blue. It's been happening. They're, they're on camera saying that this is the plan. So I do believe that that's a large part of it, the most dominant part. And then there is a liberal belief baked into certain leftists that that's just what we do here in America, that we're, quote, a country of immigrants. And there's something, there's is a bit of a betrayal of our core principles if we keep anybody out who wants to come here, not understanding at all what modern day America looks like and how it functions and what's happening in these cities. It's just a liberal utopia from people who live in penthouses in Manhattan and want to feel good about themselves. But they're not the ones who are going to get carjacked in the Bronx or have their farm equipment raided in California or have their daughter raped in Texas. So, you know, they, I don't know why they won't see reality, but they're starting to. You know, thanks to the brilliant plan to bust these migrants, quote unquote, it's illegal immigrants north. It's getting a little bit better and a little harder for them to ignore reality. But I do think that sort of basic principle of we're America, you know, give us your hungry, you're tired, you're poor without any recognition that things have changed since Lady Liberty went up. Uh, that's Omega, what some what do you mean that things have changed? I, I'm curious to, to get a kind of more fleshed out explanation because I remember, you know, uh, I remember I was talking to, I think the guy was originally from Pakistan when I was in LA uh, driving the lift that I was in. And he was kind of, he made the point that I really agreed with. He said, you know, in Europe, people say, oh, Europeans are really intolerant and xenophobic. And it's, he was like, no, it's just less room. Whereas in America, it's such a big country. Everyone can come here. Everyone can settle. And that used to be, you know, a lot of people in America would have come in a sort of illegal or semi-illegal way in the mm -hmm. past and integrated and and now that they are part of the country, their children and grandchildren are part of the country. What has changed in your opinion that means that that is less true than it was in the past? Well, I'll, I'll quote that sage Homer Simpson who stood <laughs> at the banks of the Hudson River at one point with a sign that read, go home, the country's full. And while we're not full, our cities are overrun and these people are not moving to rural Kansas uh, like, you know, the frontiersmen and trying to plant a land flag and build something and be productive citizens. For the most part, they come across the border, they go to our big cities and they live off the government for the entirety of their stay here. And that means me and that means my kids and my neighbor's kids and all of us who are productive and actually adding to society have to support them. Um, they, for the most part, more and more are not wanting to immigrate in a way that would allow the so-called melting pot. That used to be how we were in America. You know, I have grandparents who came from Italy and I have grandparents who came from, um, from, uh, Ireland and they came, they didn't, I blocked it out. No, no, I love my Irish roots. But they, they didn't, they didn't want to continue speaking Italian. They didn't, they didn't want to do all the same traditions here that they did back in the homeland. They wanted to become Americans. They didn't talk about themselves as Irish or Italian. They talked about themselves as Americans. They were thrilled to have this new identity. It's very different now. You know, the leftists 
don't want that. They're teaching you not to love America, that America's evil. In fact, they talk more and more about how it needs to be abolished. Uh, it needs to be wiped out. It's genocidal and all the rest of it. So we're, we're losing our shared cultural identity. We're encouraging people to hold on to the identities of the countries from which they came. We're not encouraging, like we used to here, pursuit of the American dream and hard work, assimilation, learn the language, make sure your kids learn the language, understand our customs, respect the country into which you've come. We're not in enforcing the rules that should govern respectable behavior like the law. And even on, you know, from small things like public urination to big things like hurting people, assault, murder. Over and over, we give people a pass. We don't hold them with bail. We give them a slap on the wrist for serious crimes. So there's a breakdown in the system overall that used to be in place and enforced, you know, 70 years ago when we were far more welcoming than we are today. And that's the thing that's been shocking for me is to see the breakdown of law and order in the United States. Because when I was growing up and we went, I went to the United States, I was always told, look, the police are much stricter here. You know, you, you need to be careful. You need to be very respectful, blah, 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 blah. But you're looking at the states now and it just seems to be descending into, into chaos, to put it mildly. Well, you do need to do all those things because you're a white man. <laughs> <laughs> so good luck to you. You're not allowed to do anything wrong. You, even the right things that you do will be held against you. But it, it, it's it, I'm not really joking because, look, these migrants in particular get slapped on the wrist. And if they're in a sanctuary city, all of which are leftist cities, then even if it's a serious crime, the local law enforcement will not tell the feds we have an illegal here who just violated a serious law, who just committed a felony. Megan, can I stop you. you there? Because there's a lot of people who are going to be listening to this who aren't American, who are not particularly au fait with this issue, and you've just used the word sanctuary city, and they're like, what does that mean? So it's various cities. They're all leftist cities. New York is one of them. Chicago is another, where they refuse to cooperate with the federal government on immigration enforcement. So what that says is, if we capture uh, an illegal immigrant, let's say they were DWI, they were driving while intoxicated, we pull them over, we capture them, or they committed a serious felony, you know, they, they committed assault and battery, and we arrest them, and we run their numbers, you know, their papers, whatever, we figure out that they're here illegally, we will not respond to ICE, the feds, the immigration, uh, immigration arm at the federal level, and tell them that you're here. We will do nothing to facilitate your deportation. And even if there's um, basically an order from the feds to turn such a person over, we will ignore it. And we also won't encourage or force any uh, information sharing by that person's family with the feds or any questions whatsoever about that person's immigration status. So you could have somebody who is like a four-time drunk driver who's actually killed people and they won't call the feds and say, send him back to El Salvador. This one doesn't have to be on our watch. We don't really need to deal with this person over and over. Send him home. He won't respect our laws. And the, the, the leftists don't understand that this is a lure. <laughs> this is a lure for these people to go to their cities. You'd be a fool to spend too much time in a place like Houston um, and not move to a place like San Francisco where now they have multiple reasons not to put you within the long arm of the law. Your skin color, if you're from south of the border, uh, and the fact that you're an illegal and somehow they see you as downtrodden and beaten down by the system before you've even ever become a part of it. But that's, that's lunacy, Megan. So what you're essentially saying is government departments are not talking to each other and the system is fundamentally broken. Oh, yeah. And you see the numbers of somebody who eventually will go too far. I mean, they'll commit like they'll they'll commit a murder that gets national attention of like a 17 year old girl. And then people say, who is this person? What was he doing here? You know, it, it makes the news. And then invariably you find out he's been deported five times. There was one guy recently who had been caught illegally crossing the border 41 times, 41, but still free to try it for a 42nd. Uh, Nothing changes, in part because neither party will fund border enforcement. It actually is going to require money. And, you know, you look at that bill that just collapsed in the U.S. Senate. It had 60 billion for Ukraine. It had 
15 billion for Israel, and it had about 11 billion for the border <laughs> here, right? It's why, why is Ukraine getting 60 and we're getting a fraction of that for our border and we're supposed to celebrate it like it's a big win. Um, they don't, they don't want to do it. I just, I just had a long conversation the other day with Paul Murray of Sky News Australia. Great guy. And we were talking about what they do in Australia. Now that's an island. So it's a little, little easier. You know, you don't have a porous southern border where people can just flood across, but they do have a problem with Indonesia, some in China, trying to get in Australia. And they have full-time military patrols up and down the coast that is most vulnerable. And they make sure that their Navy and from the air, they spot any boats coming in. Good luck getting into Australia as an illegal. If they capture you, if they see your boat, they'll stop you. They'll keep you on one of a couple islands offshore in a facility that's not great. And it's like they try to make it humane, but it's not the Four Seasons. And it's a place that you'd really like to get out of. You could be there for years, years, but you're not getting in. The solution is not come on into Australia and in five or 10 years, come back for an asylum hearing. Oh, you missed it. Oh, well, bye. That's what we're doing. That's the most we do is say, could you make it back in five, seven years for an asylum hearing? And when they don't show up, we do nothing. So we have a lot to learn from our friends, uh, you know, over in Australia and elsewhere, if only we had the will and the financial resolve. Megan, the thing that I find very strange, and I think you're absolutely right, I actually don't think it is about money, because as you say, if the 60 billion can be found for Ukraine, uh, then there's money to be found in the system. It is a question of will. And what I find very strange is, and I quote all these people in my book, all of the people on the left, uh, the Hillary Clintons, Nancy Pelosi's, Barack Obama's, they used to sound to the right of Donald Trump on immigration within my lifetime. My lifetime is not that long. You, you know, I, I've been an adult for about 20 years. I remember it. In my lifetime, everybody on the left and everybody on the right used to agree that countries need borders, right? So that's where we come back to your idea that I've seen that a lot of people uh, uh, share that this is about attempting to import more people who are going to vote for left-wing parties. And I guess I find it difficult to believe, but also easy to believe at the same time, because I can't imagine Joe Biden sitting in the Oval Office going, you know what, you know, stand down. We don't need a border. Let's get more Democrats in. But on the other hand, I can't think of other better explanations. So I'm kind of stuck in this limbo. What I see is there's been an ideological shift in the last 20 years. So how do you, what do you think the balance of those two things is? Because I just see a lot of well-meaning people who don't seem to understand that actions have consequences. Um, whereas a lot of people are now starting to, to suspect that this is deliberate. How do you try and work out which is which and which is more influential? Well, as I've said, I mean, I, there are Democrats all over the place on camera and in print saying, I need more people in my district to save my myself from losing my reelection. I mean, I need an influx of people who are gonna vote my way uh, or population that says that they're Democrats in order for me to maintain my seat. So they see it as a plus and a smart move politically. And by the way, just look at how the Biden administration treats immigrants from Cuba. If you wanna ask yourself whether this is ideological or not, those people tend to vote Republican when they come and assimilate and become American citizens. Um, very harsh on immigrants from Cuba. They're not interested in helping the Cubans. But you know, from these other countries where you're, you're just gonna get hooked on government assistance, it's a very different attitude. So I really do think it's largely political, but of course you're not wrong that now there really is a hierarchy with the Democrats, not all of them, but the leftists when it comes to skin color. And if you are anything, you know, any shade darker than Lily White, you've got a role in the destitution derby that the Democrats pay attention to. They just assume you're downtrodden, you're on their list of oppressed, and they've got some making up to you to do. So it could be, you know, in kindergarten schools here in America, it could be at the college level with the affirmative action program that was just struck down, but they're finding ways around. And it could be if you're an illegal immigrant who just sneaked across the border just to save yourself from a downtrodden economy. That's I swear that's all it is. Okay, that's wonderful. You have no right to be here. There's a way of getting in if that's what you're fleeing, economic insecurity. That's not a cause for asylum. Um, but they don't care because on their list of hierarchy, 
Uh, you are now at the top and we've somehow wronged you just by skin color. And they've got, you know, in the Robin D'Angelo mode of thinking of things to begin the conversation with an apology and end the conversation with an apology. And their behavior reflects that. We'll get you back to Megan in a minute. But before that, we've got a very exciting announcement. We want you to join us for two days of discussions and debate, which is all happening at the inaugural Dissident Dialogues 2024. This incredible event will take place in Brooklyn on May the 3rd and 4th. You'll be joining leading thinkers such as Richard Dawkins, Steven Pinker, Ian Hersey Ali, John McWalter, Aisha Akambi, Michael Schellenberger, Mary Harrington, Chris Williamson, Winston Marshall, Constantine Kissin, Francis Foster, and more. Hang on a second. Since when have you ever been a serious thinker? I love thinking. It's my favorite hobby. Sometimes, of an evening, it's all I do. Think. Moving swiftly on, we want you to join us for a gathering where everyone is part of the conversation. Conservatives, progressives, atheists, theists, left, right, and everything in between. Dissident Dialogues presents a rare opportunity to immerse yourself in a conversation with the most influential thinkers of our time. We'll tackle important topics relating to religion, science, politics, and culture. If you're driven by intellectual honesty, curiosity, and a desire for the truth, Dissident Dialogues is the place for you. It's not just an event, it's the beginning of an intellectual journey. And we want you to come along for the ride. I like rides. Dissident Dialogues is a place for dangerous ideas. Buy your tickets now at dissidentdialogues.org and be part of the conversation. And now, back to the episode. Megan, when you talked about the overcorrection early, aren't you basically saying that actually this policy is going to be suicidal for the Democrats? Because I'm guessing for every illegal you import, there are going to be two Americans who are like, this isn't what we voted for. We're going to vote for Donald Trump or the Republican candidate at the next election. Isn't this going to create a massive backlash? 100 percent. And it's already starting. I've been covering elections for a long time. And immigration is always one of the top two or three issues for Republicans, always. You know, 12, 15 years ago, terror was up there too, no longer. Um, economy is usually number one. Now on the Dem side, immigration is more and more pulling at number two, at, right after the economy. Number two for the Dems, that's entirely due to the busing program and plane program that governors like Greg Abbott of Texas are using to bus these migrants north to other cities, including sanctuary cities, so that places like New York and Chicago and Philly and elsewhere are getting a taste of their own medicine. And it's not just the Republican governors. Joe Biden is putting them on planes and flying them to places like Westchester, New York, which is steps from where I am, in the middle of the night. He just doesn't want people to know he's doing it. But he understands he's got to put them somewhere. And what's happening is, on paper, it's one thing to say, poor Texans, but you know, Texas is pretty big and I live up here in beautiful Tony, New York City, and I don't really, uh, it's somebody else's problem. I'm just gonna feel bad for the migrants and it's somebody else's problem. Now you're having stories every day of those kids in Brooklyn who were kicked out of their school, did not get to go to school because they had to house illegals there. <laughs> the the uh, kids in, I think it was Chicago, who, or maybe it was Philly, trying to remember, but whose rec center, or their rec recreational center, which had been built by the town for at-risk youth. You know, these are like inner city kids who have nothing to do but go to the rec center. And if they get kicked out of the rec center, they're probably not doing anything great on the street. Closed down because the migrants had to be in there. Or the videotape that went viral of the migrants, illegal migrants, beating the hell out of two New York City cops, kicking them in the face, kicking them in the stomach, severely hurting them as they were down on the ground, not letting up. And then when they got released immediately with no bail, flipping the double bird the double bird to the cameras as they walked out, having flouted the system. And then they fled. They got the hell out of New York. And now they're trying to collect. So bit by bit, people are seeing those things in their own communities, feeling those things. You've got uh, the governor of Illinois, a complete leftist, literally saying, mercy, mercy, please stop sending them. You've got the New York City mayor saying, I've never been so scared in my life. I don't know how this ends. We can't handle it. The city's facing collapse if this keeps going. Never in my life have I had a problem that I did not see an ending to. I don't see an ending to this. 
I don't see an ending to this. This issue will destroy New York City. Destroy New York City. 110,000 migrants. We have to feed, clothe, house, educate the children, wash their laundry sheets, give them everything they need, health care. Month after month, I stood up and I said, this is going to come to a neighborhood near you. Well, we're here. We're here. We're getting 10,000 migrants a month. One time we were just in Venezuela. Now we're getting Ecuador. Now we're getting Russian speaking coming through Mexico. Now we're getting uh, Western Africa. Now we're getting people from all over the globe have made their minds up that they're going to come through the southern part of the border and come into New York City. So one by one, you're seeing the biggest leftists in the country say, we get it, please stop it. And going to Joe Biden saying, we need help. And what they're what now they're leftists. So they're not saying shore up the border. Not yet. They're saying, give us more money so that we can house these people and expedite the work permit process. So all these people who flouted the law and came across the southern border illegally can jump to the front of the line. Whereas that French family I just mentioned is going to wait for 10 years to get a green card or to be able to work legally in the United States. All of which is to say that People are feeling it in the blue cities now, both at the government level and at the citizenry level. And it is going to change how Joe Biden behaves, even if he wins re-election. Megan, I'm someone whose family comes from one of those countries, the migrant countries. Mothers, my mother's from Venezuela. We've got one of the largest migrant populations in the world. Uh, I have family members who have had to flee Venezuela because they were journalists and they criticized Maduro's regi regime. But even I understand that there needs to be checks and balances when it comes to immigration. You can't literally open the door and say to a country like Venezuela, anyone can come in. That's just not workable. So I don't understand how well-meaning people can't see that a huge influx of people is going to put an unsustainable amount of pressure on things like infrastructure and services it's just common sense. Well, not only that, we, we've missed, I have missed one of the biggest consequences of this, and that is the fentanyl crisis. It's not entirely driven by illegal immigrants, but largely and mostly. There are some Americans who go down across the southern border or who just make it here. Um, but illegal migrants are without question bringing boatloads of fentanyl across the southern border, the cartels send them over. The cartels get the fentanyl from the Chinese and they put it in the pills and then they come over here. And we had a big hearing on Capitol Hill last week with the tech executives from Snapchat, from X, from Facebook, slash Insta, Mark Zuckerberg. And, and one of the lines of inquiry was, these kids are using your products, your social media apps, to get drugs delivered to their doorstep in the middle of the night, the middle of the day, and one pill can kill. They think they're taking an Ambien, a Xanax, whatever, something to stay awake during an exam. It's laced with fentanyl and they're dead off of one pill. That is part of this problem. And so, you know, if you are living, you know, I, I live in what's called a super zip, right? Like it's, it's a very wealthy town. These people don't think this is ever going to be a problem for them, right? They think this is somebody else's issue. You know what? You know what? It's going to become a problem for these people in the super zip. Their kids going to go off to college and try one of those pills and die. Like if we don't do something about this open border and the fentanyl crisis that comes with it, which is largely related, it's two separate things, but they're related. It's going to hit every community. We're already seeing more people die deaths from fentanyl per year in this country than we were having during the opioid crisis that we were having during the crack cocaine crisis. And that goes across class, across race. It's touching virtually every family either has had something or knows someone who's had something with this problem. So it's just so far reaching, it can't be denied any longer. And just now you're starting to see the light bulb come on. And that's why it's going up the charts And when you watch the polls on what the Democrats really care about. Because the fentanyl crisis 
It's utterly heartbreaking. When I, it, and it affects every city in America. When you're walking down the street, you'll just see someone literally splayed out in front of you. And you look at them and you think, are you dead? Are you alive? What, what's actually happening here? And then people just walk past. And you go, so, the, there is something broken with American society where that is just a common occurrence. Yeah, but there's no question. I mean, it used to be just in the major cities and it was the 1970s. And then we had tough on crime prosecutors come in and clean up the cities uh, and enforce the drug laws and also arrest. I mean, nine times out of 10, these people get arrested because they've committed a crime while on drugs. Um, but it works. Law enforcement, strict law enforcement is actually quite effective at cleaning up the streets. And we also had mental health facilities. We had places to which people could be confined. And we decided that was inhumane. Again, to them, what about, where's the humanity toward the rest of us who are law-abiding citizens who don't want to have our kids step over needles on the way to school? Um, so that's another leftist policy that's really resulted. Again, it sounded so nice to open up the doors of these facilities and protect the civil liberties of those inside. What about our civil liberties? It's another thing. You can't jail the school shooters. Uh, even if you know that they're threatening to commit a school shooting and the parent has identified them as a sociopath because of their civil liberties. What about my civil liberties? Those of my kid, do they matter? Not at all. Just all these policies that look good on paper, but when in practice, wind up hurting people. One other quick story, if I, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I interviewed a mom a couple of years ago who had two sons who were high school stars, you know, on the football team. They both went off to college. They were only two years apart. They came back home from college one night and she waited, they went to a party and she waited until they got home, like most parents still do, even if their kids are in college. And they were fine. You know, they were, they were two boys. So she kissed them goodnight and went to sleep. In the morning, she woke up. She found the one son dead. She had no idea how it had happened, what, what went wrong. She was trying to shake him. She was trying to wake him up. She was in a full panic. So she ran to the other son's room to get help. He was in his bed dead as well. Both boys had called somebody or used the internet to get a delivery of pills something that they thought was harmless, not some OD. They weren't looking to do hard coke. It was something they thought was mild. And they were both laced with fentanyl. Both of her children were dead overnight after having come home stone sober. That's the kind of thing you, we're gonna see more and more and more of it. And so I'm not gonna say those kids made a good decision you know, in trying a pill or ordering a pill from the internet, what have you. There, there's no excuse for us to be accepting the people across the southern border who are delivering that poison to our young people. You know, it used to be maybe you had some bad pot and you'd be on like an extended trip that might not be great. Now you're dead within moments. This woman's whole family wiped out in seconds. So it's not sustainable, you know, for all the reasons that we've been discussing. Yeah, and I... I there are a lot of people who have been saying that about the cocaine in New York. Now, you can say you shouldn't take cocaine and whatever else, but people are going to do it. But you just can't have people taking what they see as, in, as a drug and then just wiping out schools of people in one night. And we just interviewed, actually, uh, a guy called Michael Francis, who's a former... Yeah, I know him. You, you know Michael. Yeah, former mob guy. Uh, and he talked about, I think it was his son-in-law, his daughter's mm -hmm. boyfriend, who took an Adderall uh, to, to work on some, used to edit video for him, and again, dropped dead on the floor. So this is absolutely crazy. But Megan, we've taken you down a very dark and negative and pessimistic direction. That's because we're British. That's yeah. what we do. Uh, tr trying to be a little bit more American about it. You, you talked about the pushback. One of the things I've been really enthused about in the, the early days of 2024 is what I see as the beginning of the demolition of the DEI bureaucracy. The idea you've been talking about, about a, a race hierarchy, you know, these people are to be given special treatment over these people and it's been institutionalized in education and employment and government in all sorts of different ways. It feels to me with what happened with Claudine Gay at Harvard, with what happened with affirmative action, 
that we are starting to finally realize that this is just a new form of racism that we have to reject if we're going to fulfill that beautiful dream of people being treated on the content of their character. How do you think it goes from here? Yeah, I agree. We've we've turned that aircraft carrier around and it's just going to take some time for the steam in the other direction to get going. But we've turned it. It's it's people get it now. I do think the Claudine Gay controversy was, you know, one of the death knells that was needed to DEI. And honestly, just the anti-Semitism on campus in the wake of the Israel attack. It just, I mean, very powerful leftist Americans finally woke up and said, what the hell's happening? What, why are why are people you know praising this? How can they not see this as as terror? Why are they all over Snapchat praising Osama bin Laden? <laughs> He's got some really good ideas. That's what was happening. So it got it got people's attention in a way that was important to stopping this craziness. But I'll tell you, to me, there were, my favorite incident that it, that shows this happened just the other week. You know, Mark Cuban, who owned mm -hmm. the Dallas Mavericks um, basketball team. He he came on my show when I first launched this show back in September of 2020 and lectured me for an hour about how important civil rights are, BLM. Yeah, go go civil rights, go BLM. America's problematic. Can't be afraid to speak out. Then we got to the part of the interview where we talked about his support of China and all the millions he's taking from China and the NBA's taking of China. And he went oddly silent. It, suddenly he wasn't, wasn't a champion any longer of the very things he'd lectured me on because it's fine to criticize the United States as terrible, but when you're getting hundreds of millions from the Chinese, I guess it's different. So Mark Cuban's out there still lecturing us all about DEI. It's very, very important, very important to have representation inside an organization. And I'm not gonna say it's the deciding factor, but sure, a person's race, say their skin color, their gender, that definitely could be the tipping point, you know, that, that votes in their favor when I'm hiring someone. And by the way, the CEO of the Mavericks who worked for him, is on camera saying exactly the same, that she came in, saw a disparity, too many whites, and made big changes, and now they're 50% minority and women. Guess what? That's illegal. <laughs> it's completely illegal. I used to practice law for 10 years, and I did a lot of this kind of work. The, the federal anti-discrimination laws do not allow the discrimination on the basis of race or gender in order to help whites or blacks. That's just the way it is. You can't do it because you say, well, we want more of the downtrodden. We want more of the historically oppressed. We want more Native Americans. We just really want this one group that we don't have enough of. And that's lovely, but you're not allowed to even consider it at all. And the most beautiful part of the story was, as he's owning it, trying to show you what a virtuous person he is, the one of the commissioners of the EEOC, which is the federal organization that enforces employment laws like this, um, weighed in on X saying, yo, Mark Cuban, EEOC commissioner here, what you're doing is against the law. No, it can't be a little factor. It can't be a big factor. It can't be any factor at all. And she made the point that what just happened on college campuses, striking down affirmative action, only brings a college exception to that rule into line with the rule that's been present in employ in employment for over 50 years. So it, you know, people are like, oh, they don't, they forget this is unlawful. What Ibram X. Kendi is telling us to do, correct past discrimination with present discrimination, is illegal in education, and it's definitely illegal in hiring. And if you happen to be a white man or someone who doesn't get the promotion, and you can tell it's because a less qualified candidate got it thanks to skin color, thanks to heritage, thanks to gender, sue, file a lawsuit. That's really what we listen to over here in America, the lawyers. Do you remember the Canadian trucker protest in 2022 where thousands of Canadians came out to protest COVID restrictions and vaccine mandates? Now, these protests lasted for weeks and the people out on the streets needed money as any grassroots protest would. So people set up online crowdfunding campaigns which raised millions of dollars, it was incredible. But those campaigns were closed down and the money didn't get to the protesters because the Canadian authorities started to criticize the crowdfunding platforms, ramping up pressure on them to close the campaigns. The biggest crowdfunding platform, the one we've all heard of, completely capitulated to the demands. Now, this is where our partners Give, Send, Go come in. They stepped in when the other platforms backed off and raised millions of dollars for the truckers. 
when they were criticized and dragged through the Canadian courts, Give, Send, Go came out and said they respect diverse views and believe hope and freedom are values worth fighting for. This is why we are proud to partner with them. So if you need to crowdfund for whatever means the most to you, then don't go to the big tech platforms. Go to Give, Send, Go. Starting a campaign on Give, Send, Go is easy and intuitive. Go to givesendgo.com today. That's givesendgo.com to start raising money for whatever matters to you. And Megan, the bit about, uh, you obviously make a brilliant point and I completely agree with it, but I think the bit sometimes that we miss and we ought to emphasize too is, I don't obviously I don't know you that well, so I don't know if you've had this experience, but I'm guessing uh, as, a, as a woman in your profession, you've probably been told, oh, you know what? Um, we actually need a woman for this board or we need a woman for this. And you've been offered things occasionally. I know female friends of mine in, in similar positions to yours who just feel so demeaned uh, because they are talented and skilled and hardworking and they are where they are on merit. And yet they're being put or offered things simply because of their sex. And it's just so demeaning to the person who is getting that advantage in many situations. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember when I was at Fox News and Barack Obama was the president they were gonna have National Women's Day at the White House. And they were inviting all these top female reporters to go to the White House and you know ask a question or two of Barack Obama. And I said, you know what? I will go when you just want a great journalist at the White House. I'm not going because of my lady parts. It mm -hmm. is insulting, it's ridiculous. And honestly, like people do it to this day to they, even the ones who mean it as a compliment. I was at some seminar and, and they said something like one of the highest paid female journalists in the country. And I looked at them and I said, you don't have to say female. <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly, like, I, I didn't mean it as swagger. You know, it's, it is a little swagger, but I meant it as like, just stop that nonsense. Like, don't, I don't want that qualifier in anything. If I don't get there, if I don't get to the top in anything I'm doing, irrespective of the female thing, then don't name me. And if I do get to the top, then don't say female. It's a diminishment. It's, it doesn't, make me feel good in any way. It's, it's an interesting point you make, Megan, because as with all of these ideas, you know, you, there was a time where things weren't great if you were a woman looking to get into a certain industry or if you're an ethnic minority. But I think we can all agree that things are much better than the way that, than how they used to be. Like I, rem I imagine when you started out in your career, you were faced probably with quite a bit of sexism. Oh yeah, I mean, sure. I, I mean, I, I graduated from law school in 1995 and even those summer internships I did from 92 to 95 were, they were interesting, you know, these kind of <laughs> old school lawyers. I honestly, it was like, I, I have to say most of the time I laughed at it. And then I started practicing law and I was the only lawyer, the only female lawyer in an all male lawyer office. And there was a senior partner who was much, much older and he kept asking me to copy cases for him. And that wasn't my job. My job was to read cases and analyze them and represent clients. You had the, the paralegal copies the cases and he did not ask the male lawyers to copy the cases for him. And so I just resolved, I was only 24, 25 years old. I said, the next time he asked me to copy one of those cases, I'm gonna say something. And sure enough, he did it. And I went to his office and I said, if you want me to copy a case for you so that we can discuss it and we can strategize over how it folds into our case or our brief, I'm happy to do that. If you just want me to copy you a case because you need me to perform a secretarial role, ask your secretary or ask a paralegal. Well, he was apoplectic, this guy. He couldn't <laughs> believe the disrespect. And he said, do you think this senior partner copies his own case? Do you think this guy copies his own? And I said, no, I think they have their secretaries do it. And that was it. I turned on my heel and I walked out. And of course I was like, I'm going to get fired. He's totally going to fire me. He's going to fire me. Gonna fire. You know what happened? He called up the named partner of the firm to complain about me. And the named partner of the firm said, if you ever ask another associate of this firm to spend their time copying cases for you, it will be the last decision you make here. So they took my side. So it's just a good lesson early on. I didn't involve upper management. I didn't involve anybody. I just said to myself, I'm going to go in there and tell them, this is bullshit. Get your shit together. I'm not doing your cases. And you know what? It was a good lesson early on on how to handle that. I didn't get irate. I didn't file a complaint against the guy. It's fine. Most people with a slight brushback will move right on and be 
like they'll take the lesson and no, they won't hold it against you. I really wish more young women would be told that and take that to heart rather than trying to make a federal case out of every slight, no matter how small. By the way, you you build no muscles by doing it another way, by calling in the boss, by playing the victim, by crying in your soup. Woe is me. Well, my lady parts cost me that. This, you know, forget it. It's a chance to grow and show to yourself how strong you can be. But the problem is, Megan, that generation are not being taught that. That isn't the message that is being instilled in them. The message that is being instilled in them is you're a victim, this is an oppressor, blah, 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 blah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, look, they can go that route. Let's see how that works out for them. These are not tomorrow's leaders. That's pretty apparent to anybody who's watching them come up. And my only hope is that those of us who are raising our kids that way, our children are going to have such an advantage. In, in life and in navigating the world. Because no matter how far we've come, women are still gonna bump into sexists. Uh, people of color are still gonna bump into racists. You know, no matter how much progress we make, they're still gonna be out there. And the question is, what are you gonna do about it? You know, you can sit around and feel like an oppressed minority, whatever your situation is, or you can just laugh at it and find your own empowerment. You know, I was listening to Glenn Lowry the other day, who I love, uh, economics professor at Brown, formerly of Harvard, black man. And um, he was pl applauding the affirmative action decision and saying his feeling when he sees affirmative action is, how dare you rob me of my dignity? How dare you rob me of my dignity and, and make me have to wrestle with other people's doubts about how I got here? I was a brilliant kid. A little bit like the Matt Damon character in Good Will Hunting. You know, mm -hmm. I was a working class kid. I, I didn't have a lot of polish, but I had real, real sharp smarts. Uh, my life took a various turn. I was a father at 18 and at 19 and at 21 and dropped out of college and whatnot. And I bounced around community college, got discovered like Matt Damon in the movie. Ended up at Northwestern University where I was a wizard. I was taking the PhD level courses in these technical subjects and acing them. Went to MIT, where it's at the top of my class. Again, forgive this, but I want you to try to understand the point. So my genius, yes, I said it, my gift, my extraordinary abilities were what carried me forward, notwithstanding the vicissitudes of racism and discrimination in America. To have that minimized by somebody presuming that, oh, you didn't get the MIT without affirmative action. And it's actually true. I didn't get the MIT without affirmative action because every black person is going to be the beneficiary of affirmative action, whether they ask for it, need it or not. MIT had three positions set aside in its entering class. And those three were to be black students of the greatest promise. I was one of them in the year that I came in, even though I didn't need to be in that box in order to get in because I had A's in everything. In the PhD level courses I was taking at Northwestern, my professors were writing letters saying that I was the best student they'd ever seen, because I was. Again, I ask for your forbearance as I toot my own horn here. God damn it. Don't dishonor my amazing achievement by chalking it up to favoritism. I resent it. I don't like it. I don't need it. I don't want it. That's not a political position. I'm defending my own dignity here. So you're going to call me a sellout because I'm defending my dignity? Fuck you. I mean, please, will you get your hands off of my dignity? Let me succeed or fail based upon my abilities. Don't patronize me, goddammit. That's how I feel, too. It just, you know, stop. Stop discriminating on the basis of race. Stop discriminating on the basis of gender to help or to hurt any particular group. And if you happen to find yourself in a position of being attacked for one of those reasons, try to pick yourself, dust yourself off and move forward, move through it. If it's pervasive and you can't get past it without involving the lawyers, then you do that. But that should be the last instinct, not the first. Too, too many times now people go out immediately and try to file a lawsuit. It's like, like I said, the thing with the case files and the guy, sometimes all they need is a polite brush back and they're better and you're better. And that guy went on to become one of my best mentors at that firm. Wow, that's wow. incredible. It's a, such a beautiful story. And I think it's a really important message for 
people to hear, especially young people. They don't hear it from many uh, sources at the moment. And the point you made about your kids, by the way, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people, I have a young son and people are always such a hard time, you know, young men this, young men that. It's not untrue. You, you've alluded to it in the course of this conversation. I think there are a lot of people who... Uh, who've been openly discriminating against white men or straight white men with the evil, the most evil category that exists. However, the reality is if you raise a generation of these people who think of themselves as victim and your child is not like that, they're actually going to clean up. And that that's super exciting for people to hear that sort of attitude uh, from someone in your position. Uh, Megan, we're going to move to questions from our supporters that go on locals in a second. Uh, okay. But I want to wrap up very quickly the main part of the interview. Very, very briefly, you talked about uh, the election that's coming. Uh, I think it's uh, clear now it's Trump versus Biden. Very, very clear. Uh, you, by pres Is it wishful thinking or are you that super confident that Trump, Trump is going to win? Um, it's, it's not about what I desire. It's about what I actually think will happen. It's not to say, look, I, it's not a guarantee. I mean, the Democrats have a great, great, get out the vote machine, the early mailing situation with the ballots is a huge advantage to them. Republicans very reluctant to take advantage of the change in voting rules that were put in place during COVID. And that's to their disadvantage. If they, they really need to get on board the mail-in ballots or, you know, they're risking another election. I do think eventually they'll get there. Um, and Trump's got some legal troubles that'll dominate some of the news cycle over the next nine months. But Things are looking up for Trump on that front. Um, three out of the four trials don't like they're, look like they're going to happen before the election. And the one that will likely happen is the most BS of them all. It's the, you paid off a porn star to not talk about your affair and you didn't document it on your company books as pay off to porn star, which, okay, uh, maybe he'll be convicted. No one's going to care. And by the way, that one doesn't carry jail time. So he's kind of delayed all of these trials with motion practice to the point where I don't think they're going to be the big albatross around his neck that the Dems hoped. There's one that could still go. It's not a, not a guarantee, but Trump's on his way to pulling an inside straight here on that. Biden, all he needs is one fall and it's over. That's it. And even at this point, it, Trump's got a I think it's a 22 adva uh, point advantage over Biden on the economy, 35 point advantage on him over immigration. Um, even with the economy starting to turn around, I just don't see people saying net net were my four years under Joe Biden better than they were under Donald Trump when he came to my wallet. There's no way they're going to say yes to that. It's not empirically true for virtually anyone. And same on immigration. Even if Biden implemented Trump's immigration policies tomorrow, which he's not going to, the, no one's going to forget that he was the open borders president. He's the reason we've seen all this crime and all the things we discussed. So my gut tells me Joe Biden is in a downward spiral. Go ahead and look at videotape of him just from 2021 when he took office versus now. Many centuries ago, St. Augustine, a saint of my church, wrote that a people was a multitude defined by the common objects of their love, defined by the common objects of their love. What are the common objects we as Americans love that define us as Americans? I think we know. Opportunity, security, liberty, dignity, respect, honor, and yes, the truth. Right after I was elected, I went to a, what they call a G7 meeting, all the NATO leaders. And it, was in, it was in the south of England. And I sat down and I said, America's back. And Mitterrand from Germany, I mean, from France, looked at me and said, uh, said, you know, what, why, how, how long are you back for? And you tell me how he's going to look even nine months from now and ask people to give him another four years. I don't think people are ready to do it. And Trump, even though he's had a couple of those memory problems himself, is still vibrant. He is robust. He's feisty. And the thing about Trump is he's charming. He's totally charming. He's funny. He's self-deprecating. He's entertaining to watch. So he goes in front of the camera lens. It's like crack for people. They can't tune away. That's why he's right. He's a ratings machine. The numbers go whenever you put him on TV. 
those two dynamics against each other, real world, I just think are going to inure to his benefit. And I would definitely bet on him winning. Megan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on the show. The final question is always, what's the one thing we're not talking about as a society that we really should be? Oh boy, I love it when you guys ask me this. Hmm. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I don't know. This is a tougher issue than the last time because when I, we talked the last time, I was still pretty new in the tenure of my show. But now I've been out there five days a week, two hours a day, and we're talking about the stuff. Like, I mean, not so long ago, I would have said how puberty blockers right into cross sex hormones lead to sterility and no sexual pleasure for a child ever again. But I feel like we've done a pretty good job of getting the word out on that. Um, people don't understand. You're sterilizing your child if you do those two things. And you're basically rendering them asexual. They will never achieve climax if you do puberty blockers into cross-sex hormones. Who the hell would make this decision for their 11-year-old? Anyway, it's probably something in the gender field. I guess I'll go with this. People are still using preferred pronouns because they think it's respectful. And not enough people are coming out to explain how pronouns are rohypnol. They, it's a the name of an article that was banned all over the internet a couple of years ago. They dull your senses to what's actually happening and basically take away your principal argument when you see a man in a woman's swim lane. You can't say she doesn't belong there. You can't say she shouldn't be in the women's locker room. The rehypnol dulls you to get used to this incongruous combination and makes it somehow less problematic. And so the pronouns really do matter. It's not respectful to lie. And it's certainly not respectful to women to do anything to open up the doors to men in their sports or their spaces. Megan, stay with us because we're going to ask you a bunch of questions from our supporters that goes on Locals. Guys, follow us on over there. I wondered if she'd share her prediction for Trump's VP. Oh, I've chosen not to say, but I do have somebody in mind. So I'll give you the hints 